Across much of North America, east of the Rockies, as spring turns to late summer, a marvelous transition occurs. Fields of green become ablaze in gold. At the heart of this metamorphosis is a flowering plant called goldenrod. Using goldenrod and the species that depend on it, we will examine three levels of ecological interaction. The first level is the plant, often referred to as the host plant, because of its role in providing food and shelter for insects that feed upon it. The second level, in this case, is an insect that feeds on goldenrod and is therefore called an herbivore. The third level consists of various predators and parasites that attack the herbivore. In exploring these three levels of interaction, we will emphasize how these unrelated species affect one another. As you may recall from school lessons concerning food chains and food webs, impacts at one level can have repercussions throughout the system. After reviewing the natural history of these interacting species, we will examine two important issues. How species interactions shape the traits of organisms and how species interactions lead to the formation of new species. Our goal is to show you how science is used to answer these questions. Through such research, we gain new insights into the scientific method, the mechanisms of evolution, and the importance of the conservation of species. The biological system that we will use to illustrate these concepts involves Native American wildflowers called goldenrods. Goldenrod is actually a name that applies to many species of closely related plants. Goldenrods are widely distributed across the United States and Canada in a variety of habitats. Over 100 species occupy sites ranging from woodlands to dry open fields to moist open meadows to abandoned lots. Surely then, if not by name, most people will recognize this common wildflower by sight. Goldenrods are members of the aster family. It is the second largest family of the flowering plants. Familiar relatives in this group include asters and daisies. As in this aster, most members of this family are characterized by the presence of many small flowers arranged tightly together to form a central button or disc. The disc is often bordered by a fringe of ray flowers. This dense clustering gives the impression of there being just one flower, while in fact hundreds are before one's eyes. Numerous insects crowd the flowering tops of goldenrods. Bees, wasps, butterflies, and other insects serve as pollinators. Too heavy and sticky to be effectively dispersed through the air, goldenrod pollen is carried by these insects to other flowers. By autumn, the dried flowers stand ready to shed their seeds to the wind. Goldenrods also spread by underground stems or rhizomes. As the rhizome grows horizontally through the soil, it occasionally sends a stem upward. This produces what appears to be an unrelated and independent plant. The plant has reproduced asexually. It has cloned itself. This is so common in many goldenrod species that a clump of goldenrods is likely to be one plant. This feature is very useful to researchers as it provides many duplicate plants with the same genetic makeup. This helps to separate the effects of the plant's genes from those of its environment. The timing of goldenrod's brilliant blooms correspond with that of a less conspicuous wind-pollinated flower called ragweed. Ragweed's dull green flowers release copious amounts of lightweight pollen to the air. The airborne ragweed pollen triggers allergic reactions in many people while its source remains obscure. Unfortunately, the late summer sufferings of many people are wrongly blamed on the goldenrod. Even to a casual observer, a walk through many stands of goldenrods can reveal an unusual growth on many plants. These swellings are called galls. Galls are often present on the buds, stems, and leaves of other plants such as oaks and may assume many different forms. But what are they? Galls are indeed plant tissue, 
but this plant tissue does not serve to help the plant in its growth or reproduction. The plant has been induced to grow this tissue to provide food and shelter for an insect that lives inside. We will look specifically at the ball gall that frequently forms on the stems of the goldenrod species Solidago altissima, commonly known as tall goldenrod. These ball galls are distinct from two other types of galls also seen on goldenrods, the bunch gall and the spindle gall. All three of these goldenrod galls are formed by insects. In early spring, stems of tall goldenrod begin to emerge from the ground. Young stems are well established by May when they are discovered by male and female gall flies of the species Eurosta solidaginis commonly referred to as the goldenrod ball gall fly, or simply the gall fly. About the size of a small house fly, the gall fly itself typically goes unnoticed. A newly emerged male searches out young stems of tall goldenrod. Then he courts females with flicks of his wings and side-to-side -side bobbing of his body. The females who emerge slightly later on average also go in search of tall goldenrod. There they find the males and choose one or more to mate with. Once the female has made her choice of partner, the gall flies mate on the plants. Although she has over a hundred species of goldenrod to choose from, our tiny gall fly is very selective. In most of the eastern United States, females select tall goldenrod exclusively over several similar looking species such as Solidago gigantea or late goldenrod. With sensitive receptors on her feet and antennae, chemical clues detected during a quick walk over the plant are usually enough to tell her whether this is or isn't the species she's looking for. Upon finding a suitable host plant, she inserts her ovipositor into the terminal bud of the plant and injects an egg. So females respond to clues on the surface of the plant, but females also use clues from within the plant when they inject their eggs. Females use chemical receptors on the ovipositor as seen in this photograph to determine if the bud is suitable for depositing an egg. The ovipositor penetrates the bud, and if the bud is not suitable, then no egg is deposited. Then the female will leave in search of another bud. Over the remainder of her lifespan of several days to two weeks, the female gall fly might lay a hundred eggs distributed among many other tall goldenrods. Within four to seven days, the egg develops into a grub-like larva. The larva bores into the stem and sets up housekeeping at the base of the stem's bud. In response to the larva's presence and its secretions, the plant tissues grow and enlarge, eventually producing a round swelling about the diameter of a quarter halfway up the stem. This growth of plant tissue is referred to as a gall. The gall reaches its maximum size by mid-July. While the gall's exterior becomes a tough, hard, protective covering, its interior tissue is a nutritious, protein-rich food source for the growing larva. The larva's feeding creates a central chamber. The plant replaces the chamber's inner tissue in response to the feeding of the larva until mid-September. Then, in preparation for its exit in the coming spring, the full-grown larva excavates a passageway through the gall tissue to the outer wall. Leaving the wall intact, it returns to the inner chamber for the winter. Altogether, the immature insect lives within the gall for about 50 weeks, as a larva through the summer, autumn, and winter, as a pupa in March and April. In May, this insect's metamorphosis concludes as the pupa becomes an adult fly. Still within the gall, the fly has an instinctive urge to escape. Its ability to do so hinges upon its effort of six months ago, that is, how well as a larva the insect prepared its exit tunnel. For those that did so properly, escape is no big deal, 
just a quick and easy out. For others whose tunnel was less than perfect, it may be a long but ultimately successful struggle. For the most unfortunate whose tunnel was left too narrow or perhaps too short, the gall is a death trap. In this parasitic relationship, plant growth may slow as the plant's resources and energy are diverted to gall formation in response to the invader. The larva, however, not only acquires a food source, it is also sheltered from the elements, but not always from predators. Among those predators are the tumbling flower beetles, called Mordelostina convicta. The female beetle lays her eggs on the outside of galls. When the larva hatches, it tunnels into the gall. There it feeds on the outer gall tissue throughout the remainder of the growing season. By winter, it may enter the central chamber of the gall. Here it encounters the fly larva within the gall and consumes it. Two tiny wasps parasitize and prey upon the gall flies as well. Uritoma obtusa ventris females lay their eggs in the egg or larva of the gall fly before the gall is formed. The wasp larva develops in the body of its host, the gall fly, eventually killing it. Females of the second wasp species, Uritoma gigantea, insert their eggs through the walls of fully developed galls. These wasp larvae prey upon the gall fly larva and then feed on gall tissue. Finally, two birds, the downy woodpecker and black-capped chickadee, peck through the galls to feed on the gall flies during the winter. Thus the life cycle of the gall fly is made up of a series of events. First, the female fly injects eggs in buds in the late spring. Shortly thereafter, the early wasp attacks. As the larva and gall grow, the late wasp and the beetle attack. In the winter, the larva is still in the gall and is vulnerable to bird attack. In the spring, the adult fly finally emerges to complete the cycle. This brief account of the goldenrod life cycle and its related players is known from careful observation of the interplay among the characters. As a critical first step in science, observation has inevitably led to new questions and closer study of the interactions of these organisms. This system has been studied to varying degrees since the mid-1800s and continues to be the focus of several research studies today. We will show you how observations and questions about this system lead to hypotheses about how the system works. These hypotheses are then tested with experiments that lead to conclusions and often to new questions. This process is referred to as the scientific method. First, we will examine how species interaction shape the traits of organisms. Natural selection occurs when some individuals produce more offspring than others. Thus, natural selection can cause populations of organisms to change through time or evolve. There are two basic requirements for natural selection to result in evolution. The first requirement is variation in a population, such as the spotted versus unspotted markings of these ladybird beetles. Second, these traits must be passed on to offspring. Spotted beetles tend to have spotted offspring, and unspotted beetles tend to have unspotted offspring. This indicates that the variation in the trait is caused by genetic differences. If unspotted beetles survive or reproduce at a higher rate than spotted beetles, the proportion of unspotted beetles will increase in the population. Such differential survival and reproduction of organisms with different traits is natural selection. Natural selection on gall size is an especially interesting trait to study because gall size depends on both gall fly and plant genes. Let's look at some of the selective forces acting on this trait. After a fly has induced a gall, 
The ultimate outside size of galls varies. However, the inner chamber of galls is always about the same size. Variations in wall thickness account for the difference. One might suggest that a thicker gall means more insulation from winter's cold, but studies show that the gall provides no such value. Because of the high level of natural antifreeze in the larva's body that protects it from freezing, weather is hardly the fly larva's greatest enemy. Wasp, beetles, and birds are the real threats. The late wasp will be investigating the galls in July, long before winter sets in. In spite of her name, Uritoma gigantea, she is quite small. From head to tip of abdomen, she is just one quarter the size of the gall fly. She may or may not mate before depositing her eggs. Her unfertilized eggs will develop into males, and the fertilized eggs will develop into females. Here a female is shown mating with a much smaller male on a gall in captivity. We do not know where they mate in nature. Smaller males are common in insect species because females generally benefit more by being large. This is because, in general, the larger the female insect, the more eggs she can produce. For her to successfully reproduce, she must deposit her egg into the inner chamber of the gall. In order for her to reach her target, her ovipositor must be long enough to puncture through the gall's wall. Gall fly larvae nestled within thick-walled galls are beyond the reach of the wasp and hence secure from this predator. Other larvae, housed in small, thin-walled galls, are vulnerable to wasp attack and may suffer a fate far more grim. They will be devoured by the larval wasp, which then completes its life cycle inside the gall. Does this mean that individuals in the largest, that is the thickest walled galls, will be the ones to emerge in May? If so, the natural selection should favor gall fly females who can assure that their offspring are in galls large enough to foil the efforts of the wasp. However, should the gall fly larvae escape predation by the wasp, it is not necessarily safe and secure for the winter. From their homes in nearby woodlands, downy woodpeckers and black-capped chickadees search for galls that might harbor a meal. Although large gall size assures protection from predation by Uritoma gigantea, birds show a marked preference for larger galls. The bird preference for larger galls has been documented, but we can only speculate as to the reason for this preference. Large size may be a clue to the birds that a hearty meal is within easy grasp. The birds may have figured out that smaller galls are more likely to contain the much smaller wasp larva rather than the much larger fly larva. Regardless of the reason, having made their choice, the birds expertly peck through the now dead woody galls and extract their unfortunate occupants. This fact that birds prefer large galls means that natural selection favors smaller galls. Thus we have natural selection acting on flies for the trait of gall size. In light of heavy wasp attack, selection would indeed favor any individuals that would induce larger galls. However, if gall fly populations are exposed to heavy winter foraging by woodpeckers and chickadees, the selection by wasp is countered. As a result, intermediate-sized galls are favored. As the predator population shift from year to year or site to site, so too do the selective pressures on gall flies. For example, bird attacks are not likely to be a factor at all if woodlands where birds live are not present. Even if such habitats are nearby, the frequency of bird predation will vary considerably with the weather. In a warm winter, for instance, birds may have other, easier-to-get food available. Thus, the selection acting on gall fly populations varies in time and space depending on their interactions with other species. Recall, though, for evolution to take place as a result of natural selection, 
there must be genetic control over the trait. Gallfly larvae must stimulate the growth of gall tissue by the plant. This ability has been found to be under genetic control, that is, genes expressed in the larva can affect gall size. This was demonstrated by showing that families of gall flies differ from other families in their gall size. Thus, natural selection would have the potential to cause evolutionary changes in gall size. However, in this case, the primary effect of natural selection is to prevent further change since intermediate sized galls are favored. However, gall flies are not in complete control of the situation. Selection for gall size in the plant population may also occur. Since gall formation is detrimental to the plant's growth and reproductive success, there may be some selective pressures favoring host plant resistance to the effects of the gall fly. Forming smaller galls, for instance, would use fewer plant resources and limit the effect of the gall fly on the plant. There is a genetic basis to gall size, so the plants may be able to fight back evolutionarily. You can see the results of the effects of plant genes on gall size in the field. While some clones of goldenrod have large galls, adjacent clones have small galls. What have we learned thus far from studying how natural selection acts to shape gall size? The forces acting to shape gall size are not simple. There is direct involvement from the gall fly and from the plant and indirect involvement from the insect and bird predators. The effect of birds in particular is highly variable in time and in space, so the course of evolution may not follow the same path in every population. So, natural selection and species interactions can affect the traits of existing species. But can they lead to the formation of new species? Now we will look at how species interactions lead to the formation of new species. This is the second major question in evolutionary biology that we wish to examine with the goldenrod and the gall fly. A species is a group of organisms that naturally mate only with their own kind. In other words, members of a species are reproductively isolated from other organisms. Reproductive isolation may be due to geographic features such as mountain ranges or oceans that separate continents. Reproductive isolation can also be due to ecological barriers. Mate choice, mating times, and selection of host plants on which mating occurs are a few examples of these ecological barriers to reproduction. Choice of host plants and mates can contribute to reproductive isolation between two groups of gall flies. This reproductive isolation may result in two separate species arising from one species. This process is called speciation. Slight changes in behavior seem to be the key to this kind of speciation event. Natural selection may have favored these changes in gall fly behavior. From New England to the Great Plains and north into Canada, both tall goldenrod and the closely related late goldenrod are galled. This is somewhat surprising because of the previous experiment we mentioned showing that the more widespread gall flies on the tall goldenrod were very choosy. They would not inject their eggs into other plant species willingly, and when they did inject eggs in other species, the larvae did not survive well. This observation suggests that either these northern gall flies are less choosy or exist as two populations or species of flies, one using each species of plant. Hence we conducted experiments to find out whether there is reproductive isolation between the gall flies on the two different host plants. To do this, we looked at who they would mate with and where they would inject their eggs. The first question we asked was, do gall flies on tall and late goldenrod mate with one another? Gall flies were marked with colored dots to allow us to keep track of flies from tall versus late goldenrod galls, since otherwise they appear virtually identical. 
Matings between them were performed in outdoor screen cages in the absence of host plants. In this case, mating occurred readily between the groups. Next, experiments were repeated with gall flies of each kind in the presence of both species of host plant. In contrast to our first experiment, here each gall fly perched on its preferred host and subsequently mated with its own type of gall fly. Although the gall flies will interbreed in the absence of host plants, in the presence of their normal host plant, the tall goldenrod gall flies and the late goldenrod gall flies segregate and mate within their type. So it appears that there is reproductive isolation between these tall and late goldenrod gall flies due to their mating behavior. However, this reproductive isolation would not hold up if gall flies from tall goldenrod then injected eggs into late goldenrod or vice versa. This led us to ask the next question. Will flies show a preference for injecting eggs into their own goldenrod host? In choice experiments, gall flies were placed into cages set over both plant species. When the gall fly injects her eggs, visible scars are left on the bud. Injection scars were counted as evidence of choice. The gall fly readily injects eggs into the bud of her normal host plant. However, injection scars were rare on the alternate host. We conclude then that gall flies prefer to inject eggs into the host plant species within which they themselves developed. Thus, there seems to be considerable reproductive isolation due to behavior, that is, the choice of mates and host plants. Such reproductive isolation due to behavioral differences may lead to speciation. But how did these differences arise? First, we will try to determine whether gall flies moved from tall goldenrod to late goldenrod, or if the shift in host plant use went in the other direction. Evidence for the direction of the host shift comes from the DNA sequence that makes up the fly's genetic code. DNA sequences were examined from tall and late goldenrod gall flies from all over the upper Midwest and New England. This is done by extracting DNA from the gall flies and determining the sequences of the nucleotides A, T, G, and C that make up the genetic code. Differences in the DNA sequences are used to make inferences about the evolutionary history of the gall flies. This animation shows a slightly simplified version of the process we think may explain the present-day distribution of DNA sequences in the gall flies. First, there was a tall goldenrod gall fly with one particular DNA sequence. Eventually, this DNA sequence spread throughout the range of the gall fly. Then, over time, differences arose in the eastern portion of the range and spread throughout the east. Other changes occurred in the Midwest and spread so that the Midwestern tall goldenrod gall flies had their own characteristic DNA sequences. Then, in the east, one tall goldenrod gall fly switched to late goldenrod as its host plant, most likely due to a mutation affecting host plant choice. Once gall flies had shifted to late goldenrod, they quickly spread throughout New England and westward to the upper Midwest, carrying the eastern late goldenrod DNA sequence with them. This results in the distribution of DNA sequences we see today. DNA sequence analysis of gall fly populations supports the conclusion that tall goldenrod gall flies are the ancestors of the closely related late goldenrod gall flies. Furthermore, these DNA studies suggest that the host shift from tall goldenrod to late goldenrod originated in the northeastern United States. Finally, the fact that the host shift did not occur independently in the Midwest, but spread there from the east, suggests that the conditions needed for the host shift to occur may not be common or occur in all places. This is an important lesson for conservation since saving a single population or only part of a species range may not allow the continued evolution of new species. 
Now that we know which direction this host shift occurred in, we can ask, how did natural selection favor the evolution of flies using a new host plant? Gall flies that choose the new host and hence become reproductively isolated might benefit for a couple of reasons. First, we have found that there is competition among larvae in tall goldenrod buds. There are often many eggs injected into a single tall goldenrod bud, but because there are rarely more than one or two galls per goldenrod stem, we know that many of the larvae coming out of those eggs never form galls. On the other hand, there are many fewer eggs laid in each late goldenrod bud. Thus, gall flies injecting eggs into late goldenrod will have a higher survival rate for their offspring than gall flies injecting eggs into tall goldenrod. Second, when we counted up mortality of larvae in galls due to predators, gall flies in late goldenrod were found to have less mortality overall. This was due to less predation by birds and by the early wasp. It is not clear why birds do not feed as much upon late goldenrod galls. However, the wasp is another story. This wasp is the one that attacks the gall fly larva before the gall forms. It finds its gall fly host by finding tall goldenrod. It very rarely manages to find its prey in late goldenrod buds. Because late goldenrod gall flies have evolved from tall goldenrod gall flies, and since at least partial reproductive isolation of the two types is evident, these two groups may be on their way to forming two separate species. In summary, the tall goldenrod gall flies and late goldenrod gall flies are very closely related, yet each mates on and deposits eggs in its own host plant in preference to the other goldenrod species, and reproduces more successfully by doing so. For herbivores such as gall flies, one of the most common modes of speciation may be through host shifts that result in some reproductive isolation. Our future work will continue to examine the ways in which new species form. In particular, we will look at additional host shifts by goldenrod gall flies and tumbling flower beetles to see if these host shifts lead to speciation as well. As we have shown, this is often the way that science progresses, building upon earlier work step by step. Many people have the impression that evolution can be studied only from fossils and that ecology is studied only in exotic locations using sophisticated and expensive equipment. This presentation illustrates that by using careful observation and relatively simple tools, an understanding of the ecological and evolutionary relationships among organisms can be gleaned from abandoned agricultural fields and backyards. Indeed, other systems exist that may well serve as excellent subjects for ecological and evolutionary research. But the health of too many ecosystems is being degraded by the ever-growing impact of the human population. Within those ecosystems, there could very well exist unapparent but important genetic and ecological differences among populations of organisms. As we have seen in the gall fly, Populations may contain individuals that possess rare and distinctive traits and genes that control them. By reducing the number and or size of populations of many species, and by fragmenting ecosystems with roads and subdivisions, humans often reduce the potential for evolution. Studies of the gall fly provide important evidence for the potential role that host shifts can play in the speciation of herbivore populations. Over the coming years, ecological and evolutionary research will add to human understanding of this fundamental biological process and how it enhances the biological diversity of our world through the formation of new species.